Everything you need for the worship service will be printed on the screens right behind me. Uh, our opening song today is called Christ, the Sure and Steady Anchor. It's a newer hymn, a uh, great hymn. Uh, feel free to join in singing as you feel comfortable. You may remain seated for this opening song, and may God bless our worship here this morning. We receive rich forgiveness and mercy from his hand. We'll begin with a responsive uh, reading uh, together of Psalm 8 as part of this confession of sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? 
You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, even as we praise your name, we confess we do not treat your name as majestic and holy. In the day of trouble, we fail to call upon your name. Our sin is exposed by the holiness of your name and the light of your word. Dear friends, by the name that God placed on you at your baptism, by the name that is above all other names, by the name that knew you before you had a name, by the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. See what great love he has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Amen. May the name of the Lord be praised. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 22 through 24. Here in this lesson, God gives a a gospel promise, good news uh, to his people through the mouth of Ezekiel. This is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and planted on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruits and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. This is the word of our Lord. Our second lesson this morning comes from uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Uh, Here Paul encourages his listeners, believers, uh, to eagerly await uh, the new body, the new eternal that is waiting up in heaven. This lesson will also be the basis for our sermon uh, here this morning. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, We are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. This is the word of the Lord. Our third and final reading here this morning is today's gospel. And for this reading, please stand. We stand during the gospel to honor the words and works of Christ. And here in today's gospel from Mark chapter 4, Jesus gives us some parables, some stories that illustrate and teach us just how God's kingdom grows. 
Uh, We read verses 26 uh, through 34. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As, and as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And we'll join together in singing our next song. Uh, It's a song called, I Will Rise, a beautiful image of what we get to look forward to someday in heaven.
grace, mercy, and peace, these are yours from God our Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our Savior. My heart's just not in it anymore. I don't know if that's a slogan that we say very often in life, but I know that it's something that we've felt, all of us, so many times across the years. My heart's just not in it. I think of some of the jobs I used to have before I became a pastor. Server, bartender, golf course attendant, dishwasher, landscaper. These are all wonderful jobs. They all served me well. But I can't say that I was particularly passionate about any of them. I'd come in, I would clock in many days, I would go about and do my tasks, but I think I could definitely say that my heart so often wasn't in it. Maybe you felt that way about some of the jobs or the work that you've had before. Or maybe you feel that way right now about the job that you have. Maybe when you hear that slogan, uh, my heart's just not in it, Maybe you think of a particular hobby or activity of yours. Whether it was gardening or scrapbooking, cooking, golfing, playing an instrument, sports, card games, whatever. You used to have this hobby or activity. And it was your lifeblood. You couldn't live without doing this. But now it's something that you barely do anymore. Why? Because your heart's just not in it. The things that you used to use for this activity now collect dust. My heart's just not in it. Maybe you think of relationships. Initially, when that relationship or that romance started, it was burning. You two were inseparable. But now that bond is no more. Why? Because for one or both of you, your hearts just aren't in it anymore. You used to love going to that restaurant, but now it's been so long since you were last there. You used to love going to that place or that city or that destination with your family, but now you just don't go anymore. You used to love, but now that love is no longer there. Your heart just isn't in it. Now, in general, when when we think of this saying, I think in our world, we generally view this as kind of a negative thing. Like, I wouldn't stand up here and say with a a cheesy grin and eagerness, like, you know, I used to love going to the movies, but now I just don't have the heart to go to the movies anymore. (laughs) When you say these types of things, it's usually with a sigh and a droopy face. You know, I, I used to love going to the movie theater, but my heart's just not in it anymore. I'd much rather just stay at home. Losing heart is generally seen as a negative thing. But here this morning, here today, we're going to flip the script. God has blessed us with this life right here, these years that we get to enjoy. Uh, This life is a wonderful thing. But ultimately, our hearts aren't in this life or in this world. Jesus' familiar words ring so well in our ears that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We rejoice, we are eager, we are excited to leave this life behind and to take residence in the eternal home that our God has prepared for you and that he has prepared for me. Our hearts are just not in this life or in this world. Paul's heart wasn't in this life or in this world either. Now, as I say that, you might be a little bit perplexed. You might push back a little bit and say, well, hold up. Uh, Last week, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, did we not read that Paul said, therefore, we do not lose heart? And now you're saying the opposite right here. I mean, what, hasn't our whole focus these last couple of weeks been just on how committed and devoted Paul has been to this ministry and this work? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, Paul was absolutely uh, dedicated to running this race with perseverance. He considered it a joy to endure whatever for the sake of Christ's name. But ultimately, Paul's heart was set 
on some place different. And you see that right here in our lesson in verse 1. Where Paul starts out, Paul says that, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So in verse 1 right here, Paul plays out the worst case scenario. Persecution and hardship will continue to follow him all throughout his ministry. Uh, it may well happen that his life will be compromised at the hands of those who want him dead. But even if, even if Paul were to lose his life here in this earth, his attitude towards it, okay, because losing this life right here would not mean defeat. It would mean victory. Because immediately Paul then would go on to inherit something new and something better. On this topic of uh, death and bodies, Paul had something else to say on this. Uh, matter of fact, it was in his first letter to this very same church. I'm in 1 Corinthians 15 right now, and Paul said this, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the moral, mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. We will go from having a mortal, perishable body to one that will be immortal, one that will last forever. Paul says in our lesson for today in 2 Corinthians 5 that we will go from naked to being clothed. We'll be wearing the robes washed white by Christ's blood, one for us on the cross. And also in that first verse we looked at just a second ago, Paul gives us such a simple yet effective illustration we're going from a tent to a house. Now, I love illustrations, and this is an awesome illustration especially, because I think it's one that we can especially relate to living where we live, right? In the Pacific Northwest, and now that we're finally getting to a nicer time of year, where more of us are starting to get outside and to go camping. And I know that there are some of you who don't care for camping. You despise it. And the common reasons I hear are, you know, it's dirty, it's tiny, living quarters, it's uncomfortable, it's, it's a hassle. I mean, whatever your reason might be. Uh, but some of you like, and so for those of you who don't like camping, when you're given the choice between tent or a house, house wins easily. But even if you do enjoy camping, even if you love going outside camping or glamping or yurts or whatever, um, you too have to admit that there comes a point where you're ready to be done with it and to go back to your house where you belong. And the same is so true of our lives right here, isn't it? This place that we are staying is temporary. This body that we have right here and right now is temporary. Just like how you go camping for, three, for a weekend or for a week, and then you come back home to your warm house, your warm bed, your, your happy place. The same is so true in spiritual terms as well. Our stay here on this earth is temporary. Last week, we talked about all our eyes, how our eyes are fixed on what we cannot see. Well, today, not just our eyes, but our hearts as well. Our hearts are set on things above. So as we, as we go through, since we have this understanding now of what this life is like, as we go through these years, what should our attitude be during this lifespan? And what Paul says here, uh, he says it twice in this section, and it, it seems a little strange at first, but uh, the way we approach this life is by groaning about it. So here's what Paul says, two sections. Uh, verse 2, uh, Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Then also in verse 4, it comes up again. So for while we are in this tent, we groan. Uh, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So now here's where it gets all upside down. I mean, contrast this groaning with the rest of the world. The world doesn't groan 
about this life. The world savors this life. There are billions in this world who are eager to stay, to accumulate wealth and experiences, to stash up treasures, to live this life to the fullest, to wring every last drop of joy that this life has to offer. But for you and I as Christians, we're different. Right now, we groan. We're not eager to stay here. We're eager to leave. Because God has placed on our hearts a desire for something more, something that lasts. And if you don't believe me, just ask Solomon. You maybe you may know Solomon from the Old Testament. Uh, his story is incredible. He had so many wives that he could have a different evening companion every night for two years. 700 wives. He had unmatched wisdom. His uh, wealth and splendor was second to none. He had, Solomon had everything you could ever want or ask for. And yet, how does Solomon describe this life? Go read the first couple chapters of Ecclesiastes later. He says it's worthless, meaningless. Solomon hates this life. At one point in his book of the Bible, he said that God has set eternity in the human heart. Now, what does, that, what does this mean? Well, let me ask a couple questions. Have you ever been sad that you're on your last bite of ice cream before? Yeah. Me, me too. <laughs> Have you ever... Um, what was I going to say? Have you ever shed, um, oh, here's what it was. Have you ever been sad that you were going to, you just get done with vacation and you have to go back to work on Monday and you're bummed that you have to, vacation's over with now? Have you ever felt that way before? I have. Have you ever shed a tear after you had a good week-long visit with a dear friend or family member and now you have to say goodbye again for who knows how long? If that's ever happened to you, if any of those things ever happened to you, then you know exactly what Solomon has been talking about here. God has set eternity in our hearts. Everyone in this world craves something that's going to last. Lasting joy, lasting peace, lasting happiness and bliss. Well, by God's grace, you and I know where it can be found. In Christ alone, Jesus has made a way for us to experience eternal peace and joy and bliss. Jesus took all of our sins to the cross. He erased them and exchanged. He has given us clean, pure robes of righteousness. That's what we call God's great exchange. Now we can stand before God in heaven someday because Christ has made us perfect. Your home of heaven is set and secure. It's what you and I all get to look forward to. All of this as a result of Christ's grace. So how do, you, how do you feel about all of this? Are, the big question today, are you eager to leave this life? Uh, I was at pastor's conference this past week, and uh, I got to talking with some of my pastor friends, and the topic of time of grace got brought up. You might know what time of grace is. It's a ministry that's uh, kind of done by our church body, heavily online. Time of grace does a lot of um, online content, devotions, and videos. And they'll tackle all different kinds of, you know, tough subjects, um, abortion, abuse, gender, sexuality, the whole spectrum. And as we were talking about time of grace, I don't know how this even came up, but uh, one of the guys said to me, we were talking about one of the most controversially received time of grace videos. What do you think that the video was about that was so controversially received? It wasn't about gay marriage. It wasn't about politics. It wasn't about men and women's roles in the church. It was based on the question, will pets be in heaven? That this really did trouble many people, the thought of eternity without uh, their animal companions along there with them. And hearing that um, in those discussions this week, it reminded me that as, you know, as we think of heaven and approach heaven, 
Uh, it's not always with uh, unwavering joy and confidence and peace. Here are some things I've heard about heaven before, and maybe you've heard some of these too, or maybe you've wrestled with some of these before too. Um, if my pets aren't going to be in heaven, I don't want to go. If, how can I possibly be happy eternally if he or she wouldn't be up there with me? Is heaven going to be boring? I mean, if all we're going to do is stand around all day and just sing, I mean, that, that's going to get old real fast, wouldn't it? If I'm going to go to heaven and if I'm going to leave this life, I have to leave everyone and everything I love behind. And more than anything, that breaks my heart. Paul said in verse 8 of our lesson here this morning, he said that we are confident, I say, and we would prefer to be away from the body and home with the Lord. So that's Paul's take on the subject. But what's ours? Are you eager to leave this life or are you eager to stay? Are you confident that God has something better waiting for you in the heavens above? Another thing Solomon once said uh, is that there is nothing new under the sun. And as we talk about this subject in this lesson here this morning, I'm reminded of God's first people, the, the Israelites. God's going to rescue them and bring them out of slavery. He's going to deliver them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, and by the way, I'll give you an escort along the way there. And as they go on that journey, the Israelites, it's just constant griping. The food stinks. This journey is exhausting. At one point, they even said, God, do you know what we would prefer? We would prefer if you just left us back in slavery with the Egyptians. I need to admit, and so do you, that too often our hearts have been chained to these temporary tents. And we, just like the Israelites, have failed to receive God's perfect gifts with, unmatched, with unwavering joy and confidence. As you know, we have a large homeless population in the area where we live. And suppose after church today, I went up to a random individual and I showed them a Zillow real estate listing and I said, hey, I bought you a house. All paid for, free of charge, you get to live in it. And what if they responded and said, nah, I'd, I'd rather stay here. Imagine how God must feel when we view the gifts he's given us, the home he has waiting for us, with diminished joy and excitement. So how does one become eager to leave this life? It comes through the word. And specifically by reading these words in our section right here. Because in this section, Paul gives us the five best words, the five best reasons why heaven will be so amazing at home with the Lord. At home with the Lord, it's all right there. Now, who is this Lord and what has he all done for us? Uh, I go back to verse five from our section right here. Paul says that now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose uh, is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Now, Winnie, my dog, fills me with endless joy. Uh, my family and my friends, they shower me with unconditional love. But there's someone who does even more for me than even those two. It's God. And the same is true for you, too, because God has given you and me himself. Another name for Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus left that perfect place of heaven. He came down. He took on our mortal flesh. He walked our earth. He went to the grave and he defeated death. There was no way for you and I to experience eternal joy and peace. We, were, we would get eternal doom in hell. But Jesus made a way for us to experience that and have it. He released us from our slavery of sin. He's given us adoption, identity, and a home. 
as Paul says in this section right here, we already have a foretaste of these heavenly blessings. He has given us the Holy Spirit as a deposit. God does not dwell in temples made by hands, but God dwells inside the heart of the believer. The Holy Spirit keeps you on this way, this path. The Holy Spirit leads you in this way, in this path. He who began that good work in you will carry it to completion. And of course, the other reminder of who we get to spend eternity with is our heavenly Father. Now, you can probably telegraph this pass and figure where I'm going with this next, but you know what today is, right? Father's Day. And maybe you had, as far as earthly dads go, maybe you had a great dad or an okay dad or a bad dad or no dad. But what you do have right now and eternally in heaven is a perfect father. One who will never hurt you or leave you or abandon you or abuse you or betray you. One who will perfectly cherish you now and eternally. That's who we get to spend eternity with at home with the Lord. That's what's waiting for us on the other side of this life. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? So as we groan and as we wait to obtain what's already ours by faith, we follow Paul's advice and encouragement here in verse 8. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. We already live under God's blessing and favor and grace. We want to serve the one who has done so much for us. We want to adore God above all the other false gods of this world. We want to use this temporary tent that we have, our bodies, to God's glory in everything that we think, say, and do. We want to show radical gospel love to those around us so they too might become eager about the, same, the very same thing that you and I are eager about. Our hearts just aren't in this life, and this world. What a beautiful thing to say. And what a joyous home that will one day be yours and mine. Amen. We continue our worship service by observing our offering. We joyfully return a portion of our gifts to the Lord, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but out of thanks for everything, all the rich things he has done for us. Uh, you'll notice that we have an offering basket right here in the back as you enter or leave church here today. We also have digital and online means of giving uh, as well. Um, if you're one of our guests or visitors here today, please don't feel obligated to contribute to the offering. Just know it's our privilege to share the good news of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, with you here today. But what we will do at this time is that we will join together as a church and uh, confessing with the believers of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, uh, we will join and profess what we believe, uh, recorded in the words of the Nicene Creed. I invite you to join along with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. We'll join together now in our prayer of the church, and then we will follow that with our Lord's Prayer. As part of our prayers today, we'll also include a special prayer for the fathers uh, that are among us here today. We pray. Heavenly Father, you are holy and perfect. There is no God like you. Sinners cannot stand in your presence, yet you made a way for us to dwell eternally with you. You sent your only Son, whom you love, to be the atoning sacrifice of, for all our sins. You have promised that those who die in you live eternally in heaven's glory. Lord, it's our prayer this morning that you would set not just our eyes, but our hearts as well on treasures that do not spoil or fade. Keep us steadfast in this faith until life everlasting. Give us perspective to trust that while our blessings of this world are so good, they pale in comparison to being at home with you forever. Heavenly Father, as we observe Father's Day, we thank you for all the earthly fathers you give to us to nurture and care for us in this life. We thank you for the selfless love and service they devote to their families. Uh, encourage those among us who never got to experience a good father in this life that your perfect love, guidance, and blessing attends us all our days. Continue to bless the present and future fathers among us to lead their families according to your word. Heavenly Father, in your name we pray. Amen. We join now in the prayer that our Lord himself has taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Here at Messiah, we have a practice called close communion, uh, keeping with scrip scripture's directives that the Lord's Supper is for those of a shared uh, belief or confession of faith. Without judging anyone's hearts, we invite those who are confirmed members of Messiah or of another Wells ELS congregation to join us at the communion table here today. Um, if this does not apply to you or if you're an, you are not sure, we would lovingly encourage you to wait on communion today uh, and wait to speak to me. I'd love to share more information on this practice with you. And also, uh, lately, we've been uh, experimenting with communion on doing it up here uh, at the front, and we'll continue that again here today. Uh, the way we've been doing this is we commune the, the window side, followed by the center, followed by the, uh, the, the font side. So uh, when you leave your row, please exit from the left side of your row. Uh, come and file in up here by the baptismal font. And then when you leave the table, just walk along the far wall uh, around the back and then return to your seating that way. Thank you. Jesus Christ. 
hands, take and drink the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you on the cross for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and drink the true blood of Christ. Now may this true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, strengthen you and keep you in this true faith until life everlasting. All of your sins are forgiven. You are at peace with God. Go in peace. Amen.
Receive now with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please stand as we join together in singing our closing song here this, this morning, uh, the hymn, My God, My Father, Make Me Strong. Once again, good morning. Welcome to all of you. Great to see you here on this beautiful sunny morning. Uh, great to worship with you here in God's house to be nourished by the word. A uh, very special welcome, of course, to everybody who is watching us via the online live stream. Great, great to have you watching us as well. Um, as you're still getting uh, adjusted to our newer website, uh, just one request of our online viewers, if you would be so kind as to scroll down just a touch, and you see in the bottom left, there is a, like a friendship register card. Uh, just leave your name in that. Just helps us, helps us keep track of your visit here with us this morning. Uh, if you would be so kind as to fill that out, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, as far as announcements go, I have none. This is a slow week, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, God's blessings to everyone on your uh, Father's Day celebrations. Uh, what a great blessing from God you are. Uh, stick around, visit, say hi to somebody, enjoy the refreshments next door, uh, and we will see you back here next week. May God bless your week in him.